My name is Charles Frank, and I lived in Rochester all my life. Uh, that's Rochester, Pennsylvania. And uh, I got drafted in 1942 uh, in November. And uh, when I got drafted, I went to Baltimore, and they uh, did all our preliminaries, give us our outfits and uniforms. And then they'd load us on a train, and they shipped us to Kansas City. Uh, not, not Kansas City, Salina, Kansas. And from there, they reactivated the 94th Infantry. It used to be called the Puritan uh, Infantry during World War I, and it originated in Massachusetts. But then they reorganized it in uh, Salina, Kansas, and we trained there for a good year or so. Then we went Tennessee maneuvers, and, and then we went to uh, Mississippi. And then from Mississippi, it, you know, D, well, around D-Day 90, we sailed to England. D, after D-Day, 90 days after D-Day, we went to England, and then and a week after that, we was loaded on a, on a troop ship, and we uh, landed in uh, well, I'm trying to say, Omaha Beach, the same way the other guys did, but, but we had no bulls coming in at us. But uh, the beach was still littered with helmets and rifles and 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 a tank. Uh, it's still beams to just, just keep and a tank keep tanks from going through, you know. But they they had to clear it clear out so. So the tanks and that unload their cargoes and that. Uh, and from there, we went up to a uh, little coast town of St. Laurent and, and what's it? St. Nazaire. And there was, uh, I think, if I remember right, there's like 5,000 German troops there. It was a sea coast, and they had a, the Germans were bottled in. Because American troops bypassed that because they was on the move through France at a pretty good rate at that time, you know. And then our job was just to be sure that the Germans didn't come through. And we mostly just run night patrols on that. And if we met contact with any Germans, we were not supposed to shoot. We were supposed to go back and report what we seen because they, they just wanted to know what was going on over there, you know. And then around, uh, just before Christmas, about a week, right after the Battle of the Bulge started, we were supposed to load up and, and move for the Battle of the Bulge, but we got delayed because the 66th Division was supposed to relieve us, and one of their ships coming over got sunk, and they lost most of all their men in that, in that one ship. And so they had to get reinforcement back in that before we was allowed to leave our post there in St. Laurent. And then from there, we loaded in a boxcar, 40 guys up to a car, freezing cold weather. And, and that's how we moved up to the front. And then we loaded on the trucks and, and then we relieved the 28th Division there. And then we... We stayed there for till the Battle of the Bald was over. Then, then after that, we moved on uh, different uh, different areas. I can't remember them all. The Monkey Ranch and whatnot. We made a a river crossing, the Sar River. The engineers rolled us over, and then we we had to climb a big cliff to go to get to our post where. Well, we was lucky we'd have no artillery, no no gunfires at us. The 301st, they got all kind of artillery in that. They had a rough time. Then once we got settled on top of this hill, uh, we didn't have no supplies or nothing because they had to drop us food and supply by airplane, you know, for, for about three or four days. While the engineers built a bridge across the Sar River, 
and and they was knocking that. I could see from where I was at that they would knock send artillery in there and knock these bridges out, you know. They're they're just on uh, rubber little boats, platoons, what they call them. I think, I don't know if you know what they are or not, but then they, but then after that, they, they must have knocked out their artillery, and then uh, and that's the, just about the end of my watch cost. When we moved into Sarah and we was taking a little, uh, uh machine gun that's there and that's when I got wounded and then uh, when I got wounded I, I didn't want to go back but they told me I had to so I took back prisoners with me and from there I, I was worried because I got in the ambulance and rode across that bridge when I thought it was, wasn't too safe and, and from there I went on into Paris and then back to England and then I recuperating in England until June and they they were sending us back fast because they, the war was over and they was going to send us to Japan you know so that's where my career ended you know and I was a squad leader so I had to do whatever they, they assigned us to you know there's uh, places I've been I don't even remember you know the, I actually didn't even know, you know, and like uh, sometimes we tried to make a a morning fog skirmish, but uh, our guys were all getting lost. We had to come back, <laughs> and and there's some story I could tell you on. Uh, I had a kid in my outfit from the day one. We trained together and everything, and. Uh, we we were assigned to take a a pillbox, and when we was moving up to that pillbox, there a German come out and surrendered to us. And this buddy of mine, he spoke German. I didn't I knew him all these couple of years. Didn't even know he speak German. He said they wanted to surrender, and he said that he'd take us down to to a minefield to uh, get these prisoners, and. So we took a chance and did it, and, and we, we took all these prisoners. Wow. <laughs> so that's one of my stories. And the only the other story I have is, uh, was when we made that uh, Sar River crossing and we climbed that cliff. There was a soldier up there with a white flag surrendered. And, uh, and the, he could speak English. And he said he surrendered because he was an Air Force pilot and they demoted him down to a, to a rifle man and he wasn't going to be no rifle man. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to give up. So that's about the only stories I know of on, uh, on the war side. Oh, were you actually in the Battle of the Bulge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me about that because that's a major, major well, battle. We were lucky. Our, our job was we relieved, relieved the 28th Division and, and the and the big push was uh, hauled then. Our the job that I had was just uh, that that one time was to to guard the bridge because they had uh, the bridge all uh, explosive. So nobody's supposed to come to Newark because the Germans would have moved on through. You try to come through. We had the engineers just in back of us, and they were the ones that would blow up the bridge and that. So. That was one of our jars. Then, then we had some other skirmishes, but uh, I don't remember too much on them. Well, at Ninning, I, I think that was during the Battle of the Walsh, too, you know. That's where we lost a lot of 94th troops in there. Oh, tell me about that, because huh? I'm not familiar with it. Well, well all I, I don't know too much about it. All I, I had a letter on it. I wish I, I could have brought it. But... Uh, both sides battled there for for about a week, I think, and uh, they they finally they they gave up. They moved back, you know, and but they lost a lot of troops, and so did we, you know. And so uh, my outfit, I I was with the three hundred and second, you know. So I don't know how many guys we really lost. Yeah. What kind of um, weapons did you carry? An M one. 
the, the gas operated. Big heavy rifle. Uh, we had a BAR too. My squad had a BAR. I liked it because it had a lot of firepower. But it was heavy. Yeah. But that didn't carry because I had squad leaders didn't carry that. Because you carried an M1? Yeah. I see. Yeah, because we'd have our scouts and that, you know. That. What, um, what was it like when you first had to use that M1? How to use it? I mean, what was it like um, when you, when, like in combat, you were shooting at real people? Yeah. What, do you remember what that one felt like? Well, I don't remember ever aiming at anybody. Whenever I shot it, shot from the hip, you know. Because we had the firepower, you know. It was gas operated, you know. You shot from the hip? Yeah. Wow. I think most of the guys didn't. <laughs> you know, like, like snipers, though, they, they, they would use the, the sights. Well, as a matter of fact, snipers didn't even have M1s. They had uh, O3s, I think they called them. They, they cocked, you know. How close, how close were you to the people you were sh trying to sh hit, you were shooting at? How close? Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe 100 yards, maybe not even that, you know. When I got shot, I think I was right up by the machine gun nest, you know. Well, the thing I, I can remember about it is it, it was just like somebody hit me with a black snake whip, you know. I almost got hit and written in the end of fingers, you know. And it, uh, but that much closer, I wouldn't have been here because my bandolier of ammunition was shattered a little bit, you know. But my rifle still was in contact. I seen blood coming out of my hand, so I, I just drifted back to where the medics was. You know, the room medics were right in there, not far behind us always, you know. They were trained pretty good, you know, most of the medics. What was it like... Um you know, when you saw some serious injuries around you and even death, do you remember what your first impressions were when you saw either dead Germans or dead Americans? Well, I'll tell you, I, when I, I see one of our dead guys, and even if I saw a dead German, I kind of felt bad for him. I figured, vision in my mind that they're dead and their mother was going to get a telegram saying their son was killed. And I felt the same way for the drummer, too, because I felt that, that he had to go to war the same as I did, you know. And, but uh, that's what I always felt about, you know. And as far as seeing guys wounded, no, I've seen lots of them. <laughs> but the one I can remember most of all was uh, we, we had to take a, uh, reach a certain area out of they thought there was a machine gun nest there, but there wasn't. And it, they told us uh, just to go there and, and wipe out that machine gun nest and don't go no farther, you know, and radio back and, and let us know what's going on. And uh, we had these big old radios, so, and they, they didn't work half the time. And this, uh, I was trying to call back to headquarters, and I couldn't get it. and. and my assistant squad leader said, give it to me. He says, I'll go up here in the high grounds a little bit. He took it, and he, when he's going up there, artillery hit him and cut him right in half. And he, he was asking for, for medics, and we said, we, I had a Spanish guy with me. Is he? And he said, well, we'll just say you a prayer. <laughs> then I think a couple guys, you know, that uh, stepped on mines and that, well, it, I send it back, you know. I seen, seen a sniper take one my lieutenant on. So, a lot of those stories I don't like to, <laughs> to remember too much on them, you know. Did you ever think about your number coming up? Yeah, I always thought, because cause there's only about four of us left in my squad there for a while. <laughs> really? Yeah. So... I don't know, maybe the good Lord didn't want me or what, but I was just in luck and everything I, when I was in overseas because there's 90 days before we went and, and the battle of the balls we get held up, you know. And so all those things played 
I think a part of me still being here, you know. What got you through that? I mean, that must have been amazing every day thinking, boy, this could I don't be... know, I, I really didn't think anything about it. It was like a dream to me, you know. But you don't remember, you know. You know, you dream at nights and you don't remember the next morning what you dreamed. But that's the way the war seemed to me, you know. And uh, like when artillery shells come in, I used to never, never even... But we used to hit the ground always. You know, we could hear. But someone told me, no, you hitting the ground. That bull artillery shell already landed by the time you hear the sound. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peace of mind, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we hear that a lot. A lot of veterans say, you know, I just went about my business. Yeah. It was going to happen. Mm -hmm. It was going to happen. You, you tried to survive. That's all, you yeah. know. Like, we had a. When we first went over, we uh, they sent us up to St. Laurie Antoinette, and we had a second lieutenant. And he, we were instructed to dig a foxhole and a slit tent. One, a foxhole, you, you could clear down the end, and a slit tent is just one to sleep in, you know. And this, this lieutenant, he was digging. We thought we were going to have to get a ladder to get him out. <laughs> and we, there was nothing coming in or anything. Wasn't he, we didn't even get a chance to hear the first artillery shell. <laughs> but I guess he'd get all edge. I, some guys do uh, get combat fatigue. The squad leader that I had, he, he that's what he happened to. That's when I had to take his place because he, he took off like a, like a dog taking a fit because he, he just gets so scared, I guess. Were many many people around you shell shocked and uh, after a while were they just no I, I think he's the only one I seen but I, I heard of cases where a lot of them were guys were shell shocked you know did you ever have any problems with guys saying that's it I'm out of here or I don't want to do this I can't do this anymore no huh no all, all my guys were were pretty good at it you know. Well, you must have been a good leader. Yeah. You, you motivated them. You went through the Battle of the Bulge, and you, you did the river crossing. Yeah. Um, and then where where did you end up eventually? In, in Paris or Berlin or? Uh, Sarig, Germany. Okay. That's just, just across the Saar River. Okay. That That's where the, the last uh, battle I had. I had maps of it, and I've lost them, you know. The maps used to have, like, uh, numbers on it uh, for uh, where the enemy was, you know, and if you wanted to call for artillery in that spot, you know, would radio back to headquarters and they would radio back to the artillery, you know. So you were there in Germany when the war ended? Yeah, I, I was in a convalescent hospital when the war ended. I think it was April 6th, wasn't it? Or 7th, something like that, 12th. Okay, in England? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, when I got hit, I, they shipped me Race Street back to, I think I went to Luxembourg and then, then to Paris and then straight, straight into England. Then that was Indianapolis, Indiana, and I was convalescent there. That's when they was getting ready to ship us to uh, Japan. How much time were you really laid up with your wound? Well, really from... Uh, February 27th, until I got discharged. <laughs> when was that? That was in September. Wow, that's a long time. Uh, yeah. Wow, you were seriously wounded. Well, no, huh? I wasn't that, but I just had some fingers mangled up, that's all. But, but you had all that time in convalescing, or? Huh? You had all that time convalescing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonder they didn't, didn't send us over quicker, you know, no. But that's the reason they send us back, you know, right? Well, what, do you remember when you heard that the war had ended? Yeah. But, what was that like? Well, we weren't allowed to leave the post. It's, so I remember someone saying one of the, couple of guys stole a truck and rode into the town, you know. But, uh, but uh, we weren't allowed to go into town to celebrate or anything. Wow. I, was just, I was home with Japan. You know, I was home on a furlough. I think I, I, when I was going back, I was supposed to go to Japan. That was in, in September where the Japanese war ended. 
my girlfriend and I will on Beaver Falls, and we riding up and down the streets and hollering and whatnot. <laughs> so you were you were pretty sure you were going to go to Japan. Oh yeah. Tell me what you were thinking there. I mean that you obviously heard about how. Oh how yeah, it was. I always always said I'm glad I went to York than 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 the Pacific because I felt those people weren't uncivilized. <laughs> Uh, and especially the jungles, you know. And they had elements of mosquitoes and whatnot to fight, you know. We had the weather out there, you know. The snow, snow was two or three feet deeper. I think they had one of the worst winters. You know? Yeah, the Battle of the Bulge was freezing. Yeah. 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 Did you have the proper supplies and uh, clothing and equipment? Uh we know all we had there was regular field jackets, and the Red Cross gave us a, a wool knit sweater. And I'll tell you, it was really good. Did and we used to sleep in trenches, and we used to cut tree branches, make a mattress out of it. You know, because some of the trenches used to have water flowing down through. Because you know. during the Battle of Bulls, we got the rubber boots, and that. we used to have just. Your old shoes and the leggings. You used to have to lace up the leggings. That keeps the snake from biting you, I think. But uh, it was uh, it was late in uh, in February when we started getting uh, the boots and that, you know. Because I had a pair of boots whenever when I went to the hospital. Matter of fact, it, even in England, I didn't have no clothes. I had just had a robe, you know, because they took my uniform off of me, you know. And, of course, we, the only clothes we had on us in combat was regular field jackets and a lot of socks. We, they used to make us change socks every day. Even if they washed them out in cold water, put them back on again. Tell me about uh, getting discharged. What it was like to, when uh, you were finally sent home for good? What's that again? What What was it like when you were finally sent home for good? Oh, I, I was happy when we we landed in Massachusetts, and uh, and you know, all the guys were hanging over the ship and everything, you know, <laughs> wanted to get, get hit land. <laughs> when I, when I went over though, I went over on on the Queen Elizabeth. It was a big cruise ship, you know, England's big cruise ship. And uh, I didn't get seasick at all. I used to get lost in it because it was so big. And then when I come back, I come back in a small ship. I think it took us 14 days. And I was sick all 14 days. But uh, going over, I, did, I didn't get sick at all. It only took us four days to go over. And you came back and arrived in... Which city? In Boston. Boston. Mm -hmm. I bet you were glad to see the oh, States. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then where did you go? Then I went to Staunton, Virginia, the Woodrow Wilson Hospital. And from there I went to Indianapolis. And, uh, and that's where I got discharged from. When you came back, what, in your mind, what had changed? In the country, you changed in the country. Were, were things different? No, not really. <laughs> it's the stores and that are all the same and everything, you know. And and I, well, they, there was uh, my job. I I got my job right back, you know. And they uh, like there wasn't uh, anybody losing work at the. Not for my part, anyway, you know. Did you talk about the war much? No. Uh -uh. I don't think my kids ever heard me talk about the war. Really? Uh-uh. Well, why is that? I don't know. <laughs> I never, but they always bug me about that. They want me to go to different uh, things, you know. Uh, to tell you a little bit about my stateside life. Uh, I belong to, to the uh, Purple Heart Club. General Anthony Wayne, they called it. And uh, me and my wife both belong, I think I belonged to it for about 60-some years. Well, I still belong to it for that matter. But, I mean, we were volunteers for it for 60-some for years. We used to go up to 
Butler Hospital. We had bingos and we used to have uh, boat rides. Just Sharon and Karen used to provide boat rides. We used to take the wheelchair patients there. Oh, and at Christmas time, we had stuff and everything, you know. I think uh, right here, I think. This is only part of my time. I think it's 1,700 and some hours there. So you did a lot of volunteering. Yeah, you know, when I first went there, to the volunteer. They was uh, mostly all World War I veterans, a lot of World War I veterans, and, you know. And I said, boy, I hope I never get like that. You know, they're all in wheelchairs and you know, walkers and everything. And But uh, we, we did as long as we could until she was disabled, and I, then I couldn't. As a matter of fact, I was the, the uh, commander, I was, I was the adjutant, I was a finance officer, and I was even the State Department guard, too, at one time. <laughs> and the people didn't want to work with you anymore, and they got so that I held all three jobs at one time, and I wasn't allowed. They didn't want to lose their charters, you know. Did you ever uh, serve with anybody or meet anybody overseas that was from this area? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I walked in the, in the PX one day, and uh, here's a kid who went to school with me from Rochester. Laverne Bittner, his name was. And uh, I seen him. He's kind of a chubby guy. Heavy. And I didn't have no uniform or nothing. And I could go borrow his clothes, and we used to go to the movies and that. And he was a big cubby, and I had a buckle <laughs> to wear his pants. <laughs> and then the, my neighbor, he, he was a, in a medical hospital in England or somewhere close, and he uh, he come down and visit me. Uh, I got to go to London one day o o overnight. What was that like? Uh, that was scary looking. They, 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 they still had sh the, the bombed out places, and uh, it, it, a lot of people were still living in the uh, subways. All We had cardboard mattresses and that, the families, the kids, and whatnot. And I, I really felt bad for them over there. I, I didn't realize how bad it was, you know. How did they treat you, the British? Okay. They didn't like us going there and drinking all their beer, though. <laughs> so you were in, in Britain, you were in France, Germany, any yeah. other countries? Well, Luxembourg. Oh, Luxembourg, yeah. okay. So you got to see a little bit of the world. Yeah. Because of the war. Yeah. So let me ask you, you, you never thought about making the Army a career? No, well, <laughs> sometimes I wish they did, though. I don't know. <laughs> really? Why is that? Huh? Why is that? Well, they get a pretty fair pension, you know. If you get to rank, you know, if you moved up far enough, you know. Right. And, That's a tough life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, then after, we still got to see a lot of country. Our, our, we used to have reunions. The 94th Infantry had reunions, and we went to go to New, Mex New Mexico. We went to Buffalo a couple times, and and uh, Spokane, Washington, and one in Pittsburgh I missed all. <laughs> the closest one. Wow. That wasn't like a vacation, my wife said. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't go to them anymore? They don't have them? Or? No. They, they hard. They're, there's nobody in, in in my company that I ever seen in the list of, you know. They used to, used to be like eight, ten of us all the time there, you know. And it went it dwindled down to what, like, uh, no one, you know. And it's no use going there if you don't get somebody to talk to and that, you know. It's listen to their war stories and that, yeah. There are very few World War II veterans left, really. Yeah, yeah I belonged to Battle of the Bulge, I bet, you know. We, 
we meet uh, every three months. And we we haven't missed a parade here for a good while. They don't think we're going to have one next next year because there ain't too many of us left. I think we had over close to 100. We're down to around 30 some left. Uh, but there's a guy, his, his name was Frank, I forget his last name, but he has four Jeeps. And he brings them down to the parade, and we load into his Jeep. And uh, we, we used to march on you know, Beaver Falls Hills and Ambridge, and all, but uh, well, for the last eight, ten years, we were riding his Jeeps. Now we're having a hard time getting in the Jeep. If a young person asked you what World War II was about, what would you tell them? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is. Last year, the, the uh, Beaver Area School invited the veterans to meet with their kids. Six, the sixth grade teacher did there. And uh, so I went. And uh, we all got up and just spilled a little bit of beans about it, you know. And she, she said, you're the only World War II veteran here. Would you mind coming back next week and talk to my two classes? And so I said, I didn't want to at first, but then I said, well, these little kids might let you enjoy. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come back. And so I brought, gathered up a lot of my stuff. Uh, my book and uh, pictures and and the letters from the guys and V mail. I don't know if you know what V mail is. And uh, and I I had two of her classes and they really they asked me all kind of questions. They even asked me <laughs> one kid asked me, "Did you ever shoot anybody?" I said, "I we, I can't talk about that." <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, they they asked me a lot of questions and. And then they sent me a, 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 oh, I'd say about 25 of them sent, the teacher had him write a letter to me, uh, thanking me for my service. And I still got them all. And then they sent me a, a big picture of all us together and the teacher, and my picture, and I said, thank you, Mr. Frank, and, uh, and like a big poster. And I still got it hanging in my dining room. <laughs> So, so I, young kids do uh, ask questions and talk about it, you know. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm surprised that many of those, those kids were interested in what the war was like, you know. Do you think it was necessary? World War Two. Yeah, I think World War Two is, but I don't think these others were. Hmm. How come? Look. Don't seem like we gained anything from. It. Looks like we we're back to where we started. This is what's going on in Iraq right now. What this guys give up their life for, and they're they're right back here again. You know. What What are your thoughts on um, Korea? I had two, three brothers in Korea War. One was actually in combat. He got wounded. The other two, I call them jukebox commandos, because well, the one he was on some kind of little ship, and they just went from Virginia to, to Canada, Lake Erie, and that you know and that that's all he ever did. The other one, he went to Germany, but uh, you know there was no combat there. The war was over, so that's the reason I used to call them jukebox commandos. <laughs> And how about Vietnam? Vietnam? Yeah, what do you think of that? Well, I, I used to think it, it, it was for the good, but after, after the war was all over, it seemed like uh, nobody, you know, uh, favored it, you know. And they kind of, those, those poor soldiers suffered in that, and they, they didn't get no glory whatsoever, you know. Well, people treat me real well. You know, I wear that since World War they all, a lot of them thank me and that, you know. Then I get a 10% discount because I go to Lowe's. I don't know, I'm, I'm just proud that I was a veteran, that I did serve, 
And, uh, but, uh, if I had my choice, I wouldn't do it, you know. But uh, being I had to, uh, I don't feel bad that I ever went. I wouldn't, I think, uh, it's something that I, uh, I don't know, appreciated that I did serve and that, you know. Especially when people come up to you and thank you and that, you know, you're, you're, they recognize what you did, you know. Yeah.